Welcome to Innovation Talks. Join us weekly as we discuss with distinguished industry guests how to refine and improve corporate innovation and new product development. Hosted by Paul Heller, Sophion Chief Evangelist. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'm glad you joined me today. I hope you're doing well. I want to say thank you, and I'd like to start by saying thank you, first of all, to you people who have listened, whether it's been the whole run of the series or you've just joined recently. You know, we've been going almost four years, and we're coming up on 200 episodes, and I think it's time that I finally say thank you. And we've had, can you believe this, 97 guests from all different experiences, book authors, consultants, thought leaders, practitioners, experts, novices, you name it. And we've covered more than 30 topics. So we've covered things like automotive and chemical and food and beverage. We've covered things like uh, processes, whether they be a lean, agile stage gate. We've covered project management. We've covered portfolio management. We've covered all sorts of aspects of leadership and culture. So anything that you feel you need to better understand or help you be better at innovation, it's probably in our archives somewhere. And uh, we've covered things like um, sustainability. That was a big topic with some real great people and great experts who had a lot to share. So, you know, I spent my career trying to help others, other companies and other people be more successful at innovation. The podcasts are kind of an extension of that. It was It was a way to give back, to try to help people learn some things or be more successful. We wanted to share knowledge, insights, best practices, um, and we didn't want it to be an interview. We wanted it to be more of a discussion with the real aim that you would walk away saying, you know, I learned something from that. And uh, if you did, nothing would make me happier. I never once pushed Sofian, although the podcast was supported by Sofian and funded by Sofian. And so we wanted you to think of Sofian as a company that cared about innovation, but that was different from every other software company out there. And hopefully uh, you see us that way. That was really our intent. I was lucky enough to pick the title Innovation Evangelist. Or even for a while, I was going by chief evangelist. I was a CTO of Sofian for many years, but I found myself in more recent years, it was about 20 years, but in more recent years, I was speaking more about why innovation was important and how to be more successful about it and focusing outbound as many CTOs do as their products get more mature and inbound the the operation in Sofian was able to continue making technology choices and architecture choices without me so I I was very outbound focused and we came up with the word innovation evangelist um Greg Kotiki and I did, mostly because that was a better label for what I was doing. But that word confuses some people, especially Europeans, maybe who don't have a, a good enough familiarity with the English language. I've had some really funny looks when I've said what that I'm an innovation evangelist, yet in, in North America, people just instantly understand it because they connotate it with the religious side of that must be what what the europeans hear mostly when they hear evangelist they hear you know religious evangelist but it's not that if you go back in the mid 80s where this term came from apple computer was coming out with a macintosh and they needed to convince the market that the market needed this product and a fellow by the name of guy kawasaki did that and he was called the first evangelist, the first either what you want to call it, marketing evangelist or technology evangelist. He kind of even may have coined the term, but he was wildly successful and is credited for a large part of the success of the Macintosh product line back in those days. And it's a fun read to look up Guy Kawasaki's Wikipedia page. That explains what evangelism is, what he did. Apple continued to have evangelists who were internal evangelists, product evangelists, user experience evangelists, making sure that the different product teams in Apple were doing things the right way, spreading the message about how to do it better, how to do it right. And so the the label has fit 
what we've tried to do, what I've tried to do very well. And uh, I figure if I am 1% as successful as Guy Kawasaki, I'll be wildly successful beyond my dreams. So there's my role model, if you want to call it that. You know, the word innovation, we've talked about it many times on this show. What does that mean? I've asked my guests many times how they got into innovation, but I've never told my story. And I thought I'd spend a a couple of minutes here just to tell you my story and some of what I learned along the way. When I left the university, I went to work for IBM and my first four years were internal in a laboratory. And then I went out into the field. They were looking for people to join their sales organization, their field organization. And they put me through a great training course. It was a sales training course, not not a customer support engineering course, but sales. And I think that was a phenomenal experience that I had in my career was to go in and actually be in the sales organization because you have to learn to handle objectives, ob- objections. You have to learn to be inquisitive with customers and tease out what their real needs are. So it was just in my career, I consider that as something that was very important. In fact, when people have asked me, Paul, I want to be a CTO someday. How do I get there? I say that one of the things you need to do is to experience different business disciplines. And uh, certainly sales is very powerful. Um, you're going to be a much better CTO if you've been in sales for a while. I think consulting is another good one. Customer support, another good one. And certainly engineering development, especially for a software company, very important. So uh, when I was with IBM, I started to take on the role of a consultant, even though I was in the sales organization. And I started working with Union Pacific Railroad. Turns out they were extremely innovative, but I don't think we had that label at the time. But they were looking at making a, get this, a, a, a railroad car that could go, go down the track at 60 miles an hour with a camera pointed down, capturing the video of the ties and automatically identifying rotten ties that need to be replaced and ge- geographically or where they were, you know, exactly geo positioning. And then a laser scanning the profile of the rail to determine if it was out of spec so that rail should be replaced while it's going 60 miles an hour down the rail. Now, this is in the 90s, so you could just imagine where technology was. The other great project that I worked on with them was dealing with maintenance of way. When they take a track out of service because they have to replace the rail or the ties or do whatever maintenance work they want, that means the trains aren't going to travel during that period. And it's a very complex problem where you have to ask yourself, do I take the track out for eight hours because we've got that much work? Do I take it out four times for two hours? How much of an interval in between? How do I reroute the trains, the traffic? And we were using a technology called expert systems to uh, study this. And uh, expert systems was really the forerunner of what we know as AI today. All of the AI we know came out of expert systems. And so this was in the 90s. We weren't calling it AI, artificial intelligence, calling it expert systems. In fact, we weren't even calling it that. We were calling it a maintenance away optimization capability, but, but, but way, ahead, way ahead of its time. Um, and, but that was all innovation. It was fun to see how the, the world has evolved since then. From there, I moved into a small startup in, in, in Colorado. It was called Synapse, which later renamed itself called Talus and was eventually acquired by a big ERP company called Bond. But what we did is we made a product configurator. We saw that there was a, a problem where people in compl- for complex products were selling products that could not be manufactured. They were complex and they needed power supplies and they needed rack space and they needed all different attributes. And the organization was making mistakes, selling things that couldn't be delivered. If you, uh, for you in America who were around in the 1990s buying computers, you might remember a a company called Gateway 2000. And Gateway 2000 um, was using uh, our 
technology when you answered the phone when they picked up the phone and you called them they were using our product to say whether that computer could be one you could buy so you would order whatever you wanted you would order a certain size you want it in a small case i want three disc i want two floppy drives one hard drive and and if that couldn't be assembled because the case was too small that person taking your order would know it right then and there and be able to get the right case for the order um we worked with a trucking company and you could spec out a whole truck and then the customer might say they have a special need like something that needs more power they, the example they used i don't know if it was real but but imagine the person wants a cigar lighter which needs a bigger alternator which needs a bigger engine which may or may not fit in the cab as designed so i mean these type of things these complexities of these vehicles and so I think that's where we learned about configuration and about the fact that system software can't be preset. And that served us very well. I, I joined Sophion and we met Robert Cooper, Dr. Robert Cooper, and learned about this innovation process called StageGate. And there, were, there wasn't much software out there at the time doing it. There was one company ahead of us that was trying to do it. And their software was failing because they couldn't handle the volume. Originally, everybody thought this would be a departmental app, and they were so wrong. It was, a, it was an enterprise app, and they couldn't scale. They went out of business, and we were, we were still there. And so maybe we made the right technology choices, and they didn't. And they tried to rewrite, and they couldn't, right? And they didn't make it. But this concept of configurability, you know, your process is going to be your process, there might be best practice, but you're going to have your unique things about it. You're going to have your way of measuring success, of measuring progress, of measuring outcomes that's going to be different from somebody else's. You might care about revenue. You might care about five-year revenue or revenue in year three. Somebody else might be caring about market share or shelf space. That's their definition. So we knew it had to be configurable because everybody's going to do it different. And those experiences working back in the days of of, of the product configurator from, from Mentalis, that was, I think that built um, a lot of understanding of how to do that. So a lot of lessons learned along these ways. I already mentioned the fact that it's good to have experience in a lot of different areas of the business. It helps you understand those areas. And let's face it, innovation is cross-functional, no matter what, no matter how you look at it. It's marketing, it's sales, it's manufacturing, it's distribution, it's product development, it's customer success. It's, it's all these aspects that have to come together and be aligned these days for a product to be successful. And so I think some of the other lessons I learned, you know, the need for compassion and empathy, especially among your colleagues, especially when the going gets tough. Um, I think staying positive is a huge lesson learned. I love watching new people come into a company because Everything is green. There's no bad people. Everything's an opportunity. Everybody's on the same footing. And you have an instant respect for everybody because they were there before you. And you're going to learn from them. You're going to appreciate them. Then over time, we all get jaded. And we decide that this person is not somebody I want to learn from. And this person's not right. And that's a shame, really, when it's happened. It's like a, like a loss of innocence, like the child who, who no longer is a child anymore. Um, and so the the lesson is to try to stay positive and try to try to pretend that you joined yesterday try to see the good in people you know i've never met a person who wanted to destroy a company or had subterfuge on their on their objective they maybe they're out there but i've never met them everybody tends to have a good heart a good intent and i think understanding that was was a real key lesson that I learned through the years, especially, especially in innovation. There's more I could say, but I'll just leave it at that. You know, there, there's plenty of other lessons learned as well. We've talked about some of them over the years. Um, so I just like to say again, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me on this journey so far. I want to thank the wonderful guests that I've had so many, so many great people who've been willing to share and even after the episode is over, they've all invited you to reach out to them, to follow them, to contact them. And hopefully some of you have taken that advice and, and had further interaction with these fantastic people. 
Um, I'd like to thank the people at this point in time in Sofion who made this made this successful. It all began well. The, once the concept was there, and I'll talk about how it began in just a second, but a fellow by the name of Mike Hutchison in marketing stepped up and said, I'm going to figure out how to do this. And he did. And he got us launched. He got us out in the market. He got us out on the podcast channels. He got us going. And then he turned the reins over to a wonderful lady named Casey Walker. Those of guests who had worked with Casey would remember her very, very fondly. And she kind of drove the thing forward in terms of, of getting guests and getting guests lined up and comfortable, being ready for the show, kind of figuring out how do we do that? How do we make our guests comfortable? So the process of, of dealing with guests and then turn that over to a, a really a great marketing person called Chloe Shoebridge. And Chloe just then kind of took it to the next level in terms of, of really getting us organized and being able to, uh, to understand the guests and develop social media content that made sense from the, from the episodes. And if just, you should just check out Chloe Shoebridge. And then finally, and not least, our current producer, Emma Hughes, I, I think the world of Emma. She's been just so wonderful to work with. Our guest lover. And what she's been able to do is figure out, okay, from all this great stuff that's happening, how do we drive content? How do we extract out the great stuff that matters? And, and we've written a lot of white papers and, and blog articles and other things that, that carry those learnings that we learned in the podcast, they carry them forward to, to all of you as well. So I really need to thank those four people. I think they all had, a, a, had the producer role through the podcast and they've all made it better as we went on. And, and Emma is the ultimate producer now. And then I would be really remiss if I did not mention how this thing started and mention one individual, Greg Kotikia, who had the vision to do a podcast. He got me started. He, I said, Greg, I don't know how to do this. He says, don't worry, you'll be fine. I said, Greg, I have no idea who to talk to, no guests. He says, don't worry, I'll give you guests. And he did. He gave me like 10 guests right away. Those early guests were all his find. And I really appreciate him giving me the opportunity to stretch and go into something new and do this. So it's been fun and I really enjoyed and we're you know, we're cooking along and, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. So with that, I'll close with something I say every time, but I really hope you do have a great week ahead and thanks for joining us. Take care, everybody, and bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week for Innovation Talks with Paul Heller. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For additional information on today's topic, check out sophion.com, S-O-P-H-E-O-N.com, where you will find plenty of innovation-centric content and corporate best practices. If you'd like to discuss anything with Paul or would like to get in touch with the show, email us at talks at sophion.com.